Our scripture lesson this morning comes from 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 13. Now, concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world exists and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and from whom for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge, since some have become so accustomed to idols until now. They still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block for the weak. For if others see you who possess knowledge eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So, by your knowledge, the weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed. But when you thus sin against brothers and sisters and, and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never again eat meat so that I may not cause one of them to fall. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I need to ask the next question, but how many of you have been involved in either currently or previously raising small children? How about that? So can you remember those mornings when it was a Saturday morning? and you were planning to sleep past that ungodly hour of 8 a.m., but suddenly there's knocking on your bedroom door. Mommy, Daddy, I want some eggs. I want breakfast. Make me pancakes. You know, the first inclination might to be, oh, I'm upset that I'm not getting to sleep late this morning. But the reality is, when the, ch the children come to you asking for food. They don't go out the front door and go to the neighbor and ask for food. They come to you. And what that indicates to you is that you've got a special and unique relationship with them. You should be honored at that request because of that relationship. And the reverse of this scene is also tragically true. It was described by Dr. Russell Moore in his book, Adopted for Life. Moore describes going to an orphanage in Russia as they were in the process of pursuing adoption. The silence in the nursery was eerie. The babies in the cribs never cried. And they didn't cry, not because they never needed anything, but they had learned that no one cared enough to answer. Children who were confident of the love of a caregiver cry. For as Christians, our cries, our needs when taken to our Creator in heaven is proof of our relationship with God, our connection to the great caregiver. You know, one of the most commonly asked questions by Christians is how do we strengthen our relationship with God? How do we build that closeness that allows us to instantly reach for God when we have thanks or prayers or praise to share or when we have trouble and we have needs and we, we need help. What is it 
that's going to bring us closer to God. Scripture gives us a lot of good advice in this area, and sometimes it does it by pointing out what doesn't bring us closer to God. Do you remember that verse in our epistle reading today from 1 Corinthians chapter 8? Paul is talking to the church members in Corinth about eating or not eating food that has been offered to idols. Paul comes right out in verse 8 and says, food will not bring us close to God. Okay, we can cross food eating off our list of building a close relationship with God. But here's the reality. We all have something or someone in our lives that we're holding on to tightly. Oftentimes, it's not Jesus. We have something or someone that we say it's good to be close, but often that's not Jesus. I'll tell you one thing that I've seen that we're very close to. We're obsessed with our smartphones. One study by D-Scout showed that the heaviest smart u- smartphone users click, tap, or swipe on their phones 5,427 times a day. Wow. Now that's the top 10% of phone users, so you might expect that that number would be high. But the rest of us still touch these addictive things 2,617 times a day. That's no small number. This research soon had, uh, firm had recruited smartphone users and installed special software and it tracked each user's interaction over five days. And by every interaction, we mean a tap, a type, a swipe, or a click. We're calling them touches, it explains. According to the numbers, the figures mean the heaviest users are touching their devices a couple of million times a year. And probably the most interesting thing was that the people that were surveyed completely underestimated their number of touches. While they were initially shocked by the number, 41% of them said they didn't really think it was going to change the way they interacted with their smartphone. So let me ask you this question. How many touches, how many taps or swipes or clicks or things take place between you and God on a given day? If the number of times you were in contact with God could be tracked, would you be shocked by that result? Would it be because of how often or how infrequently that we were in contact with it? Come near to God and he will come near to you is what it says in the book of James chapter 4 verse 8. If you want to be close to God, you want to be in that place where you're face to face with Jesus saying it's good to be close to you, then you look for those ways to come near to God. We come near to God by practicing spiritual disciplines. We can think of our lives as Christians as a spiritual adventure. One way to begin the discussion is to talk about John Wesley's means of grace which we do as a good Methodist. John Wesley taught that God's grace is unearned. It falls on us like rain all the time. That that we're not supposed to be just idle, enjoying the grace and sitting back and basking in the glory, but we're to engage in these means of grace. The means of grace are ways God works in us, strengthening our faith, confirming it so that God's grace pervades through us as disciples. So let's take a quick look at the means of grace. At some point, we'll probably do a nice Bible study on them and dig deeper. But let's just do a quick overview of the means of grace. They can be divided into two categories, works of piety and works of mercy. The works of piety have both individual and communal practices. Individual practices are things like reading, meditating, studying the scriptures, prayer, fasting, regularly attending worship. Here we are, all practicing a means of grace this morning. Healthy living and sharing our faith with others. The communal practices are things like regularly sharing in the sacraments, 
sacrament of baptism, the sacrament of holy communion. Christian conferencing, which means talking with other Christians, maintaining transparency and accountability, going to small groups for Bible study and discussions. The works of mercy also have individual and communal practices. The individual practices are things like doing good works, visiting the sick, visiting those in prison, feeding the hungry, giving generously to the needs of others. And the communal practices are things like seeking justice, ending oppression and discrimination. When John Wesley was ministering in the 1700s, his principal focus was on ending slavery. And we need to also address the needs of the poor. Can you hear those means of grace reflected in our mission statement here at Rapid City First? Loving God, loving people, making a difference. To make disciples for the transformation of the world, which is the United Methodist mission, means that we need to grow vital congregations. We do that through a spiritual adventure that's empowered and connected with the Holy Spirit in the means of grace. Spiritual goals are, by, are, are accomplished by connecting the means of grace with church practices. And we're working on all of that here at Rapid City First. And we're excited to invite you into that process, both here and in person and our online community. Remember what I said during my first sermon here? If you want to know what we believe, come and see what we do. So let me just summarize the past eight days here at Rapid City First. On the previous Saturday, we participated in the Interfaith Forum on Homelessness here in Rapid City, across the street at Faith Temple. We met with care providers and advocates and members of the homeless community to understand the depth of that problem here in Rapid City. On that Saturday, we also hosted a young artist competition right here in our sanctuary. It was a place where uh, beautiful music was heard throughout the day, but people who don't normally worship with us came and saw by looking at our bulletin boards, by talking to our members, by just being in the sanctuary, the kind of things that we do here. It exposed other people to our mission. On Tuesday, our team hosted Moms Morning Out and served young kids of all ages in a Christian learning environment. On Wednesday night, our Church in Action Cafe served a great meal, and afterwards, we had a time of Christian conferencing and Christian education. On Thursday, the Moms Morning Out kids were back and learning about God in a fun environment. On Friday, Rebecca and I visited a member of this congregation that's in the healthcare facility over at West Hills Village. And after that, we went out to lunch with a bunch of prime timers here from the congregation for another time of Christian conferencing discussion and planning. And that night, several of us went over to Rapid Valley United Methodist Church for their soup supper and bake sale. And people were coming up to us saying, hey, we, we see you on, on TV. We see you on your live, your live streamed worship. You know, welcome. And, and it looks like you guys are doing good things over there at Rapid City First. And yesterday, the youth group from Grace United Methodist in Piedmont was here in our church. They were eating lunch down in the uh, fellowship hall and playing some games. They had been in town bringing their youth group, I think there were about 14 of them, and going around to the statues in Rapids and hanging capes and hats and mittens and things that they had made for people that need support in the cold here in Rapid City. But it was our church that hosted them while they were doing their mission project. And by the way, on, on Wednesday night at the, at the Mission Possible event, our youth were off making Valentines to be taken to a local nursing home on Valentine's Day. Can you feel it? God is moving in this place. And we want you to come and be part of it all. And it is, this isn't all. Coming up, we're going to be starting a Lenten study called Give Up Something Bad for Lent. 
and there'll be a couple of different calendar opportunities to, to take that study. We're going to be starting a ladies' Bible study called Get Out of Your Head, using the book Get Out of Your Head by Jenny Allen. And I'm going to be looking to start a men's study called Mighty Men of Prayer. We're doing things here at Rapid City First, and join us. When I think of a model for somebody who understood and lived the power and presence of God, I think of Brother Lawrence of the Resurrection. Brother Lawrence was a Carmelite monk in the 1600s in France. He was a cook and a sandal maker at a monastery in Paris. He taught and lived that God is present in ordinary life, in the commonest of places, in the most mundane activities. He had a single-minded dedication to the practice and presence of God and maintained that that practice is both simple and easy. I don't have time for an extended dive into Brother Lawrence. If you want to read some of his writings, feel free to stop by my office or send me a note and, and I can let you borrow a book or two. But let me share just part of one of his maxims. The holiest, most ordinary, and most necessary practice in spiritual life is that of the presence of God. It's to take delight in and become accustomed to his divine company, speaking humbly and conversing lovingly with him all the time, at every moment, without rule or measure, especially in times of temptation, suffering, weariness, or sin. We must continually apply ourselves so that all of our actions, without exception, become a kind of brief conversation with God, not in a contrived manner, but coming from the purity and simplicity of our hearts. Can you hear the power in those simple words? God is with you all the time. Draw near to God in simple conversations. Use the means of grace to tap into God's presence and power Come near to God, and God will come near to you. Do you know what I ask Jesus when I walk with him during the day? Can you show me more of your plan? What should I be doing? But then as I imagine Jesus standing up, what I say is, don't leave. This is so good. It's so good to be close to you. I want this every day, all day. I hope that you see that God is not looking for you to follow a set of rules. He's looking for a close relationship with you. What do you think would happen if you went all in for God? No more flirting with this Christianity thing. What if you went after God with everything that you are? I don't want to ruin it for you, but I can tell you what you'll find on the other side of that pursuit. You'll find the most incredible life and wonder why you waited so long. Let me make it practical for you dive into the things that we have going on here at Rapid City First to help you love God, love people, and make a difference. I know without a doubt if you seek God with everything that you are, your life will blow your mind. You're going to look back and say, what the heck? Why haven't I been doing this all the time? If you're worshiping with us online and you can't get here physically to Rapid City First for any reason, Please know that your prayers, your financial gifts are so important to our mission here. You are just as much a part of our family as the people sitting here in our congregation. And we're looking for our upcoming Bible studies and Lenten studies and things like that to be able to be telecast on Zoom so that you can be participating with us in these studies if you can't get to our physical campus. For many of the studies, we'll make sure that you have any books or materials that you need. Just let us know on the sign-up sheets in the parlor or send me a note, Pastor Rich at RapidCityFirst.org. And let me also mention, if you've got your bulletin, if you're worshiping with us for the first time or uh, you have a change of address or something, please tear off that little thing at the bottom and put it in one of the offering plates so we can keep track. We're working on an updated church directory 
If you're worshiping with us online, please send in your information to the church, and we're going to include that in our church directory. We're going to work on getting pictures in the directory this year, so we'll have a new updated directory. And likewise, on the, on the other side of the bulletin, there's a prayer form. If you've got a special prayer need or prayer request, please fill it out. There's a contact form on our webpage that you can fill out if you're online and send it in to us. We do pray over these prayer requests at our church staff meetings. We have a prayer team that prays over them, and we'd like to keep your special needs in prayer. So please send that in. In closing, love God because he loved you first. Pursue him with all of your heart. Let's be a church and a people that want Jesus every day. Come to Jesus. Be close to him and let the world know about it. Thanks be to God. Amen.